uh, to in the in the next one hour i'd like to talk about the journey of particle physics from electron to the higgs boson this is a journey of uh, uh, 125 years and i will not be able to do justice to all the uh, points that i wish to make here but uh, the, here's the plan of the talk i would like to uh, convey to the students what is particle physics why do we need to do it and uh, more importantly, how we have arrived at the current scenario, current picture of particle physics. The journey from electron to the Higgs boson, and we'll see why electron in a minute. And then in the towards the end, uh, if there is time, I'll briefly talk about uh, what we expect to see next, uh, to do next in particle physics. So let me start with this quote from the Guardian, which uh, describes particle physics as the subject which is unbelievable in the pursuit of unimaginable. It says, you can point the smallest fragments of the universe, you have to build the biggest machine in the world. They are talking about the Large Hadron Collider. Some of you might have heard about it. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, you'll, you'll get an introduction today and hopefully you'll go back and find out what it was. To recreate the first planet of a second of creation, you have to focus energy on an awesome scale. So we'll briefly talk about this uh, a huge experiment to which the quote is referring. But basically, particle physics is a subject which is trying to look at the most uh, fundamental uh, uh, questions that the mankind has ever asked. But the questions that we, the particle physicists, seek answers to are the same as asked by the ancient philosophers. That is, what are the ultimate components of matter? What, what is everything made up of? And how do these components come together to form matter in the form in which we see it? So uh, the answer to these questions requires, first thing, as we said, the components of matter, and then the forces that govern their behavior. How do they behave? What are the forces responsible for uh, the, the way the uh, matter particles behave? And the job of a theoretical particle physicist is to find a mathematical framework which will describe how the constituents, all these constituents are put together to form matter, how the, they, these uh, particles interact with each other, and how one can predict their behavior under different kinds of conditions. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, fam famous slide. I mean, uh, the earliest answer uh, we know from centuries, people have been asking this question, what we are made up of. Hindu philosophy has the concept of panchatat. So Greek philosophy also talks about the four elements. And uh, this, this is from where the man started asking this question. And where, where we are today is this is the present description. So this is the end of the, this could be the end of the slide. This could be the answer to the question. What are we made up of? What I will try to do in this talk is to uh, tell you how we have arrived at this picture. So what is this picture? You see a, a, a outer circle, which has all the elementary particles which make up the matter. So the particles in red are called quarks. Their names are up, charm, top, down, strange, and bottom quarks. The particles in green are called the leptons. So you have the electron as the most familiar lepton, and it has a neutrino with it, which is called nu e. And just like electrons, we have two more uh, leptons called muon and tau lepton. And then correspondingly, they have, they have with them their own neutrinos. The second circle, the inner circle in blue, has four uh, names which are the names of the force particles. So when these matter particles interact with one another, they exchange certain particles, and those are called the force or exchange particles. So for example, this gamma is the photon. Everybody is familiar uh, with it. I hope all of you know that when two electrons interact with one another, they exchange a photon. In the same way, when particles interact through the strong interaction of the nuclear force, they exchange what are called the gluons, that is G. They are eight, of, eight in number. And when particles interact with one another through the weak interaction, which is the force responsible for radioactivity, they exchange, they exchange these particles called W and Z bosons between them. So the question that we are asking is, how did we arrive at this picture? So first, let us see how what keeps these particles uh, together. How how what are the fundamental interactions? So we we need to know what are the particles and what are the forces, and then we build a theory which will explain how these interaction take place between the uh, particles. So this picture uh, from the internet, and I'll be showing you many, many pretty pictures from the internet, because this is the, that is the best way to condense this vast knowledge of 125 years in uh, one hour. And this slide shows uh, the four uh, kind of forces that we know. 
gravity of course uh, we are not going to talk about the uh, standard model of particle physics which is the current theory of particle physics does not talk about gravitation for the simple reason that at the length scales that we are talking about uh, gravitational force is much much weaker than the other forces uh, the other three forces are which are contained in the standard model are electromagnetic force which is the force which is responsible for binding of electrons in the atom or uh, for the atoms coming together and forming the molecules and uh, then we have the weak force which is uh, the force responsible for radioactivity for the you know, energy generation in sun and uh, all kind of weak decays and then there is a strong force uh, which is the uh, nuclear force at uh, micro level which is responsible for the neutrons and protons coming together and uh, uh, staying together inside the nucleus or uh, the quarks coming together and forming the nucleons uh, what is the difference between these interactions they uh, they inter uh, they differ in their relative strength so strong force is the strongest as we uh, as the name suggests weak force is the weakest and electromagnetic is somewhere in between their ranges are different uh, the strong force is short range the electromagnetic force is very long range and so on and each one of them has a carrier particle or the mediator which carries the force so as i said when two electrons interact they exchange a photon in the same way when uh, uh, two quarks interact through a strong direction they exchange a gluon uh, when a uh, particle interact through a weak interaction so both the quarks and leptons take part in weak interaction when particles take part in a weak interaction then uh, they exchange these w or z bosons so each one of the forces has a Uh, ele uh, uh, elementary particle, which is the force carrier. So these are the properties of the forces which I have just stated. And gravity, of course, is the uh, is a long range and the weakest of them. And we uh, are not going to talk about it today. So this picture of uh, the world made up of, being made up of quarks and leptons and the forces being uh, uh, conveyed through the exchange particles. How did we arrive at this picture? So this story began. with the discovery of the electron and uh, it it came to a important point with the discovery of higgs boson why electron because electron is the one particle which was considered uh, elementary in 1897 and it is still elementary therefore i have given the title from electron to the higgs boson rest of the particles which were considered elementary 100 years 125 years back for example proton and neutron in early 20th century they were considered to be elementary constituents of the matter but now we know that they are made, made up of a smaller constituents so uh, as time progresses the definition of what is elementary also changes as science progresses we are going to we are able to look deeper and deeper into the matter and then what is elementary today may not remain elementary tomorrow and that is what has been happening how did this happen that is the subject of elementary particle physics is also called high energy physics why uh, we call it high energy physics because of two reasons the first is that to create particles with high mass that is we are creating in the lab we are creating very very heavy particles we need very high energies and this follows simply from the einstein relation e is equal to mc square the second reason reason is that to probe smaller and smaller distances we need higher and higher energies so let me take a minute to explain this statement what is the relation between scale and energy in the inverse relation why so uh, we are uh, exploring the matter the particle physics uh, uh, is exploring the matter at scale distance scales of the order of 10 to the power minus 15 meter or smaller if i want to uh, look at uh, distance scales of the order of 10 to the power minus 6 meter for example i can use ordinary microscopes and i know that the wavelength of the light should be comparable to the size of the aperture and therefore if i want to see a, uh, an object of the size into the 6 meter i can use ordinary light if i want uh, to see smaller objects for example of the order of 10 to the power minus 9 meter then i need electron microscopes because the wavelength associated with the electrons the matter waves associated with the electrons is uh, of that order for a particle beam also when i am doing an uh, experiment with uh, particles the collision experiment uh, 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 in an accelerator then i can also associate a wavelength with the uh, particles using the de broglie relation so and there is a inverse relationship so higher is the 
uh, energy of the particle, small as the wavelength associated with it, and therefore smaller are the distances at which which can be probed using this particle plane. So to see objects of the size of electrons and quarks, we need particles which have billion times more energy than what we have here. So the smaller is the system you want to see, the more energetic is the probe you need, and therefore uh, to get those energies, you have to build larger and larger machines. So this is a picture of uh, which shows the relative scales in different branches of physics. So in atomic physics, for example, the typical length scales are 10 to the power minus 10 meter. The energies are uh, that will be involved will be of the order of an electron volt. Uh, when you go down to nuclear level, the distances are uh, shorter by a thousand times. Energies are also uh, higher by a thousand times. So you need an, the typical energies in nuclear physics will be in MeV. Then uh, for proton, uh, you go to even shorter length scales, you need energies of GeV and so on. Here I have shown uh, the length scales involved in various uh, areas of physics, from astrophysics to astronomy, then uh, ordinary classical mechanics, where we have, uh, we have sizes of the order of one meter, human uh, body size. Then you go to the uh, biology, biological systems, and you have uh, length is, uh, scales involved are much smaller, 1,000 times, 10,000 times smaller than a meter. Uh, still, uh, a smaller size, you go to the molecules, molecular atomic systems, you need, uh, you have systems of 10 to the power minus 9 meters and so, and then uh, finally the nucleus and the uh, nucleon. So these are, these are, so the length scales uh, in physics vary from 10 to the power minus 15 meter at the smaller side to 10 to the power 22 meter at the larger side. And therefore you need different kind of probes to ex uh, explore these systems. So what kind of uh, eyes we need for different kind of uh, objects is what is shown in this slide. So start right, starting from the uh, uh, size of the universe. Uh, you, again, I have plotted the size of the objects on this scale, and then you can see what is the instrument used. So you have large radio telescopes when you are uh, looking at galaxies. For planetary systems, you have the telescopes where everybody has must have used one. Then uh, and when I, I am look at the size of everyday uh, objects like this dog or a human uh, being, uh, lengths are of the order of a meter or a few meters, then you, our eye, human eye is the instrument that is used to see the object. You go further down, you need telescopes, then um, uh, microscopes, then you need the electron microscopes and so on. So when we come down to the uh, length scales in particle physics, 10 to the power minus 16 meters or even smaller, what is the instrument? So they are, the instrument are the particle accelerators. They are the eye with which we see the uh, uh, systems, microscopy system in particle physics. So how do we see the objects at the smallest scale? Obviously you are not seeing it with the eye. The, the, the way you see it by using huge machines, which speed up particles to very high energies. And then, uh, so like, for example, this is a picture of the Large Hadron Collider. This is a ring which is 27 kilometers uh, in circumference. And there are uh, two beams uh, uh, rotating in uh, opposite directions and they're being accelerated, accelerated around, around this ring. And then when they are sufficiently, when they attain sufficiently high energies, they are made to collide at four collision points. So there are four detectors put across the circumference, uh, uh, which are called uh, LS, uh, Atlas, CMS, and LSCB. And uh, at these collision points, the particles are made to this rotating beams are uh, made to collide. And around this point where the collisions take place, you put huge detectors. Okay, so, so these detectors, the, this uh, tunnel uh, in which these things are rotating are about 175 meter deep underground. And the uh, detectors are, I mean, uh, of the size of several story buildings, they are put there. And in this detector, the particle, the, the scientists collect the end product of the collision. So you can see here, there is a collision. This is, this is the beam coming and hitting here. And then all these colored lines that you are seeing are the particles which are resulting from the collision. So the scientists accelerate the particles, smash them, and then uh, look at the end products. And they uh, try to find some patterns in them, in the pattern of the particles which are coming out. And from that, they try to infer uh, information about the uh, interaction. So this is how we see through the accelerators. And this seeing uh, through the accelerators 
requires a lot of job a lot of people are involved there are the experimentalists who are uh, working with these accelerators there are the theoreticians who who make who try to find the uh, mathematical laws which will explain the results of these experiment and then there are phenomenologists so you can see the when i uh, for the experimentalist i have put a picture of rutherford scattering experiment there are a lot of equations with which the theoreticians are working and now they also work with uh, huge computer systems and then there are phenomenologists this is a grid computer where, where uh, so these uh, phenomenologists take the experimental uh, data from the experiment and they take the uh, uh, description from the theory and try to try to uh, explain the data using this theory they try to build models and these models uh, if they are not able to explain all the facts they try to improve the models make more predictions and uh, then they uh, tell their predictions to the experimentalist who again go back in the lab and check the new predictions and that is how the science in general and particle physics proceeds so the story of particle physics is a beautiful tale of this give and take between the theory and experiment i will try to uh, share some of this excitement some of the beauty uh, that is uh, involved in these uh, explorations and as i said it can be considered to have taken birth in 1897 when the electron was discovered which is still uh, which is uh, even now elementary so to begin with the atom was considered to be the uh, elementary particle and then the thomson gave his plum pudding model which said that all the positive charge of the atom is spread over a sphere and the electrons are embedded in it then came rutherford and he did his famous uh, experiment uh, in 1911 and uh, the experiment consisted of as uh, you must have done in your uh, high school uh, is consisted of bombarding uh, an alpha uh, part, uh, bombarding alpha particles on a gold foil and looking at the distribution of the scattered particle as we see in this picture so this is the gold foil and there is a, a alpha particle emitter alpha particles bombard this and then they, they, this is the detector where you are uh, trying to find all the particles uh, you are trying to find the distribution of particles now if uh, thomson's model was correct then most of these alpha particles would have gone undeflected but what rutherford found was that there were some particles which were scattered in almost in the backward direction and this fact indicated that there is something very hard and very positively charged inside uh, at the center of this atom and that is how uh, uh, this was called the nucleus and the nucleus of hydrogen atom is the proton and that is how the uh, progress from the atom being elementary to the proton and uh, electron being elementary came this picture came in. so this is what it means that uh, the result of rutherford experiment that is heavy positively charged nucleus surrounded by negative light ions so the next question that needed answer was why is the helium atom uh, four times as heavy as the hydrogen although it has only two electrons so if it has two electrons it must have two protons also and therefore its weight must be twice the weight of the hydrogen atom however it was found to be four times and the solution as you know is that there are two new neutrons also so this uh, discovery of neutron was made in uh, 1932 by james chadwick this is the experiment uh, where he bombarded uh, beryllium with alpha particles and you found that there are some neutral uh, radiation coming out of it, uncharged radiation so the nucleus is uh, it was established that nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons now uh, what keeps them together because protons are all positively charged they should just uh, uh, you know repel each other so what keeps them together is the nuclear force which is much much stronger than the electromagnetic force and then yukawa came up with this hypothesis that there must be another particle we called it meson uh you, you, it was called yukawa's meson which should be responsible for this force just like the uh, electromagnetic force is because of the exchange of the photon the nuclear force must be uh, being caused by the exchange of this yukawa's meson photon was another uh, elementary particle which was known from uh, way back in 1900 when planck came up with the hypothesis of quantum of light uh, to explain the black body radiation Einstein uh, carried further, and he explained the uh, uh, photoelectric effect using the concept of quantum, and it was established that photon is actually a light is actually a quantum. It comes only in, in packets. And compound uh, scattering experiment established that these uh, carriers of electromagnetic force are actually particles which are which were given the name photon. So this uh, photon is the first example 
and long known example of interaction being mediated by exchange particles. This is a concept which is used in the current theory of a standard model. At that time, so I am talking right now, I'm talking about the period 1897 to 1932. So that, that period, another particle was hypothesized. Uh, and hypothesized means it was not discovered experimentally, but people proposed that it should be there. Why? Because if you look at neutron decay, uh, neutron decay into a proton and electron, and you can calculate uh, by simple uh, uh, energy momentum conservation, you can calculate the energy of the outgoing electron should be given by this expression, which has all the constants and therefore this energy should be fixed. Therefore, if, we, if I look at the energy of the um, electrons coming out of this neutron, it should be fixed. However, what one found was an spectrum of energy like this. So then there was a spread in the energy and this could be explained if there was another particle coming out with proton and electron. So Pauli suggested that uh, now nobody was seeing any such particle. So this, therefore Pauli suggested that this particle must be uh, massless. It should not be carrying any charge. Otherwise it would have been seen in some detector and it must be very weakly interacting. And the name neutrino was given by Fermi. This, so this is the actual uh, one to uh, three body decay, which, uh, which can give rise to a spectrum uh, like this. And the curious thing is that uh, it, although a neutrino was hypothesized in 1930s, uh, it was discovered experimentally only in 1956 because it required a lot of effort. It is very weakly interacting and uh, it's very difficult to set up this experiment. However, people believe that neutrino exists and it was considered, it was established that it is one of the elementary particles in neutrino. Another antiparticle that was uh, uh, discovered in, the, in that period was uh, positron. Again, positron was hypothesized first. Uh, it was proposed first. It was a consequence of Dirac's theory of uh, electrodynamics because uh, electrodynamics requires a quantum theory of uh, a relativistic theory of quantum mechanics. And that relativistic theory required that along with the electron, there should be another particle for uh, consistency of the theory which should carry opposite charge to the electron. Otherwise, it should be just like electron. It was called the anti-electron or anti-particle of electron. So this was called positron. And again, uh, soon after, in 1931, uh, Anderson uh, found this particle in a cloud chamber photograph. We'll come to what is cloud chamber in a minute. So uh, the long and short of this uh, discussion is that between this period, 1897 to 1934, 32, the list of elementary particles was pretty small. There was electron, proton, neutron, and photon. There was Dirac's positron. There was uh, neutrino. And then there was Yukawa's meson. This was all that uh, was, which were considered to be elementary particles. And then, uh, uh, now we know that protons and neutrons are not uh, elementary. They are made up of smaller particles. They are made up of quark and anti-quark. And uh, how did we come to this picture? This uh, started by observation of a whole lot of new particles with the discovery of a pion in 1947. So all the particles which were discovered uh, in, after 1947, um, between 47 and 60, for example, they were called hadrons. And uh, there were hundreds of such particles. And it was very clear that they cannot be elementary. So first, let us look at uh, this question, where and how do you find these uh, new particles? Electron and proton, we know very well. What about the particles that do not form ordinary matter? There are three sources of elementary particles. The first is cosmic rays, then the nuclear reactors, and the particle accelerator. So at that time, in the 40s, 30s and 40s, early days, the main source of elementary particles was were the cosmic rays. These are the highly energetic particles which are coming from outer space. They hit the atmosphere, and then when they hit the atmosphere, they create secondary particles. And then this decay into further lighter particles and so on. So you get a shower of particles like this. Here the proton, pion, neon, all kinds of particles come. So these uh, people used to uh, put their detectors into balloons and send them in upper outer space, upper space, uh, atmosphere, and uh, do their experiments like this. So how do you detect these particles? Various kinds of detectors are used. At that time, people used cloud chamber, bubble chamber, spark chamber. All kinds of uh, uh, detectors were used, which are still uh, even now part of the uh, form part of the big detectors in uh, our colliders. Uh, basic mechanism for detection is the same. You have a highly charged particle. 
which pa passes through a chamber of gas and ionizes the uh, matter inside and it leaves a trail okay you put this chamber between the poles of a magnet so if the particle is carrying a charge it will be deflected uh, and uh, as it passes through the uh, medium there are uh, droplets or bubbles formed over the path and from uh, that you can you get traps like these okay now by studying these traps uh, you can uh, figure out what is the uh, particle because the chamber is kept in a, between the giant magnets uh, so a charged particle with a certain momentum will move in a circular radius which is uh, given by this uh, uh, radius given by this and the curvature will give you the momentum and also the sign of the charge if i what what is what is the particle coming uh, is a neutral particle the neutral particles if it decays further into charged particles then you will get these fork like uh, you know uh, pictures in the cloud chamber photograph so uh, analyzing these tracks one can find out the identity of the particle or, or neutral particles also so you can see when it is mu plus mu minus the curvature is the same when it is uh, the neutral particle is decaying into a proton and a pion then the curvature are uh, different because they have different masses so this kind of things uh, uh, this kind of studies led to two uh, new particles in the period 37 to 47 which one was the muon which was uh, had a mass of 106 mev and the other was the pion which, which had a mass of 140 mev so uh, are there any questions yeah so uh, uh, the question somebody has written that neutron and proton ko gluon stick karte hai but suppose hum electron electron and electron neutron ko bahut pass se laye to strong force exist karta no electrons don't do not take part in a strong interaction first thing okay so let let me finish uh, Uh, about uh, what kind of interaction uh, is uh, can take place between which kind of particles so uh, your question uh, about electron electron force being mediated by uh, gluon is not valid because uh, electron don't take, take part in a strong interaction so let me just continue uh, for the moment uh, about this uh, this historical uh, development so uh, 1937 this muon was detected and 1947 Uh, another particle called pion was detected and they were masses of 106 mev and 140 now what do you mean by mass uh, being in mev because mev is the unit of energy one electron volt is the energy that an electron gains when it passes through a voltage of one uh, through a um, gradient of one volt and mev is 100 and uh, 10 to the power 6 electron volt so this is a unit of energy what do i mean by saying that mass is in mev so i will take a very small diversion for those students who don't know the answer to this question uh, the weight of the proton is uh, 10 to the power of the order of 10 to the power minus 24 kg which is very small so if i have to use this unit again and again in, uh, as i have to do in particle physics uh, then uh, this is very inconvenient and therefore one looks for smaller units and this unit is mev over c square remember e is mc square tells me that unit mev over c square is a unit of mass then in particle physics we you go do one more step and we use units where we take velocity of light to be 1 and in this unit this is called natural unit in this unit mass of the proton is 938 mev which actually means 938 mev over c square so the particles uh, discovered in uh, cosmic rays uh, these two particles pion and muon made the list a little longer by 1947 and uh, Uh, these are the different uh, masses of different particles which were discovered however soon after that in a period of this 13 uh, years a whole lot of new particles were discovered in cosmic rays and uh, the list became really really long so we already had electron positron proton neutron photon muon neutrino and pion and then the list of new particles was rho meson k on lambda there four of them uh, and lambda eta w Three kind of sigma, two kind of gas states, and it went on and on and on. And these particles were heavier and heavier. And at some point, uh, people, you know, uh, stopped. Uh, I mean, could not think of new names, so they started putting stars. So you have a sigma star, you have a cascade star, uh, you have a k star, and so on. So this list became uh, very very long, and it was clear, very clear at that time that there cannot be so many elementary particles. 
Uh, one more thing that was found was that some of these particles, which were uh, being found, had uh, uh, behaved in a strange way. Uh, so at that time, people had started uh, making the accelerator also, and uh, some of these particles could be created in lab also. So it was found that when uh, some of these particles, when they were created, they were um, the time scales. They were created quickly. Time scales were short, but when they decayed, they decayed slowly. So the time scale associated with the decay mechanism was must have been different from the time scale associated with the uh, production mechanism. And for that reason, they were called strange particles. And we assigned uh, to to decide when the decay can take place, when it cannot take place, etc. Again, people uh, invented a new quantum number, which was called strangeness. So all these particles, which were having mass and charge and other properties, they, all, they were also assigned a property called strangeness, which uh, changed in units of 0, 1, 2, et cetera. It could be negative also. Okay. So uh, the question now was that, can all these hundreds of particles be element? Obviously, no. So people started looking for patterns uh, in, in, in these particles, uh, in the properties of these particles, just like in the periodic table, you have patterns. Uh, uh, you would like, uh, you if you try to look for patterns in the particle spectrum, then maybe you will get an uh, insight about what, uh, it, the constituents which must be making these particles if they are composites. So the need for classification was felt, and the first classification was based on the mass. So the particles which were very light, uh, after the Greek words, uh, lepton, they were called leptons, meaning the light ones. Then the particles which were very heavy, like proton, neutron, lambda, etc., they were called baryons. And the particles which had inter intermediate mass were called pions. The next classification was on the basis of a spin, uh, which you are familiar with. And uh, spin is an intrinsic property. Electron has spin half, photon has spin one. So you are classified uh, the particles between fermions and bosons. Then the next classification was done on the basis of interaction. The particles which take part in a strong interaction, like proton, neutron, etc., they were called uh, hadrons. And the particles which do not take part in a strong interaction, like the electrons, muons, neutrinos, they were called non-hadrons. Then one come, tried to combine these two classifications and uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, classify the particles into uh, hadrons, uh, fermionic hadrons, and bosonic hadrons. So the hadrons which had half integer spin like proton and neutron, they're called baryons. And the uh, hadrons which have uh, integral spin, 0, 1, 2, etc., they are called mesons like pions and kaons. Non-hadrons are particles which do not uh, take part in strong interactions. So these were at that time were electrons, muons, and neutrinos, and antiparticles, and the intermediate vector, vector bosons, W and Z and gamma, the W and Z were not seen, but there was a theory of uh, electromagnetic interaction emerging, which required the presence of these W and Z bosons. I'll come to that later. So uh, next I, uh, classification was on the basis of isospin. It was found that certain particles have, uh, have very similar masses and similar properties, except that they have different charges. So uh, the, uh, for example, the nucleon, the proton and neutron, they, they can be called different isospin states of the same particle called a nucleon. So just like electron has a spin up, isospin is just like spin. So just like a spin half electron can be in spin up state or spin down state. Similarly, you assign a property isospin, I equal to half. <laughs> uh, to the nucleon. And then you say that uh, if the isospin is up, then it will be proton. If isospin is down, then it will be neutron. So similarly, uh, so basically this I quantum number can ha has a third component, which can be half or minus half, it is just like spin. Okay? So uh, the spin uh, I3 I half is proton and I3 minus half is neutron. Similarly, the three pions, the three pions, uh, which have charges plus one, zero and minus one. And these charges, uh, these particles uh, were put into one triplet and the triplet was called the pion which is a particle with isospin 1. When isospin is 1, I3 can be 1, 0, or minus 1. And these three particles correspond to the three isospin states of the pi. Similarly, sigma could be put, the three sigmas could be put into one triplet and considered as one particle. The chaos, K0 and K plus could be put into one doublet and could be called one, one particle and so on. Then Gelman and, uh, uh, so I went uh, 
step further and they try to uh, tabulate uh, both the isospin and the strangeness of all the particles. And what they found was that if you plot the strangeness on the y-axis, and if you plot this third component of isospin on the x-axis, then all the lightest eight mesons and the eight lightest baryons, remember what are baryons? Baryons are particles like proton and neutron, which have half integral spin. And mesons are particles like pions, which have integral spin. So the eight lightest mesons form a hexagonal pattern like this. And eight lightest baryons also form a hexagonal pattern like this. So this, and there are some features in this pattern. For example, uh, all the particles along the diagonal have the same charges, K plus, Pi plus, K naught, eta, Pi naught, K bar naught, uh, Pi minus, K minus. So it's similarly, in the second diagram, all the particles in, along the same horizontal line are in the same isospin multiplet. So K naught and K plus are isospin half. Then uh, Pi minus, Pi naught, Pi plus are isospin one. Eta alone is isospin zero and so on. Similarly, here proton and neutron are isospin half, uh, the three sigmas are isospin one, and so on. So all the particles, one they, people tried making these diagrams for all the known uh, these hundreds of particles, and they found that all the particles could be uh, put into this kind of patterns and another kind of patterns, which I'll show later. So the question was, what are these diagrams? Why, why is this happening? And then people uh, discovered a strange uh, resemblance with something completely different that is mathematics in group theory. So uh, in mathematics, there is a, uh, an object called group and there is a certain group which is called a C3. We will not go into the technicalities, but basically there, there are objects in uh, mathematics which are called representations of group SU3, eight dimensional representations of SU3, which is represented pictorially form exactly the similar patterns. Okay. So, but how does that serve us? That serves us because in mathematics, we know just like you can add two numbers and get a bigger number, you can have two smaller representations of a, of a group, combine them to form bigger representation. So this picture that we were seeing in, for, in the quark model, in, in, in the, in the uh, hadron spectrum, they were eight dimensional representations which are bigger representation of SU3 and the smallest representation of SU3 is actually three dimensional. That is, it has only three points. So this is a picture of the represent, fundamental representation of SU3. And starting with this, just like starting with one, you can construct all the bigger numbers. Starting with this simple, uh, simple uh, fundamental representation, you can construct all the representations of SU3, including the eight dimensional one, which was uh, showing the uh, particle behavior. So uh, SU3 has two such uh, smallest representation. One is represented by a knotted triangle and one is in, represented by a uh, triangle. And you, you can do this, uh, you can play with this uh, simple exercise. You can just lift this triangle and put the center at the vertices of all the three points here and you will form, uh, form the hexagonal pattern. So by, by combining two such representation, I could construct the eight dimensional representation of SU3. And therefore, the proposal uh, that was made in physics was that probably there are some more fundamental particles, three of them, which belong to the fundamental representations. And all the hadrons are made up of combinations of these fundamental representations, these fun fundamental particles. So analyzing the regularities of uh, in, in the pop particle properties, Gelman and Zweig came to the suggestion that all the baryons are made up of three quarks. You can also combine three triangles and form this uh, hexagonal patterns. These, these uh, three quarks are called up, down, and strange quarks. And as far as the mesons are concerned, corresponding to every quark, there is an anti quark. So there is anti U, anti D, anti S, U bar, D bar, S bar. All the mesons can be constructed by combining a, <coughs> uh, a quark triplet and an anti quark triplet. U and D form an isospin doublet and as quark in an isosimilar. This was the basic quark model proposed. And as you see in the, uh, if you noticed in the previous picture, the charges that one assigned to these uh, particles by looking at the properties of the uh, group theory, uh, taking clue from the group theory was their fractional charges. So the U and D quarks were 
having uh, u quark was having charge plus two thirds of the electron charge, and the d quark was having uh, charge minus one third of the d and s pair having charge minus one third of the electron charge. So this is your quark model where you you find uh, you can look at you can consider all the uh, known particles. Uh, these are the baryons, and these two are the mesons. As combinations of three quarks, so a proton is u, u, and d plus two thirds plus two thirds minus one third, which is plus one. Charge neutron is u, d, d, which is zero charge. And the uh, mesons are combinations of a up quark and a d bar quark or a up quark and a uh, u bar quark. So the uh, all the particles, therefore, all the eight fold wave diagrams could also be written as combinations of these uh, quarks. So the baryons could be written. All the baryons could be written as Three quark combinations, and all the mesons could be written as uh, uh, quark and anti-quark combination. There are other kind of patterns which were also found. For example, the after the lightest eight baryons, the next eight baryons form a triangular pattern which which had ten particles, so four, three, two, and one in each line. Same kind of pattern as you go from up to down, uh, as you go vertically downward, the strangeness uh, you, uh, increases in unit. So strain is zero minus one minus two minus three, and as you go along the same uh, horizontal line, you have particles in the same isospin multiplied almost the same masses, and if you go along the diagonal uh, way, you uh, all the particles have the same charge. And the quark model, the basic quark model, even if you don't uh, worry about uh, combining the uh, pictures, you can just write the u u u combination, u u d combination, etc., and you can reproduce the quantum numbers that is the Charge and the strangeness of all these eight particles in this baryon decuplet. There was a problem here, which was that at the tip of this large triangle, there were three particles: delta plus plus, delta minus, and omega minus, which were supposed to have three identical quarks, so three u's, three d's, or three s's. Okay, and that had that uh, was a problem with Pauli exclusion principle because quarks are fermions. And all exclusion principle says that no two fermions can be in the same state. So if they are having a spin up, and uh, all the three spins, the, their total spin of delta plus plus is three half. So if all the three spins are pointing upwards, you have uh, three identical uh, particles in the same state, which is not possible. And as a solution to that, uh, people realize that one needs to assign one more quantum number to these quarks, which should be different for the three identical quarks. And this was called colors. And that is the reason that we need to have three colors. They were given the name R names R, B, and G. These, these are not actual colors. These are some names given to the additional property that we were assigning to the particles. And it turns out this property is responsible for strong force, just like electric charge is responsible for electric force. So one could then construct this the problem with the Pauli um, exclusion principle was solved by. Uh, forming combinations of colorless combinations of three quarks. For example, you can have equal amounts of R, B, and G to have a colorless baryon, or you can have equal amount of R and R bar so corresponding to color R. You also have, and the anti quark will have anti color because anti particle must have all the quantum numbers opposite to the particle quantum numbers, and therefore uh, you could uh, get rid of this problem coming from the Pauli exclusion principle also. Okay, so uh, then we had uh, this. Uh, so um, okay, so what I have uh, shown there is the table uh, is that the actual number of quarks is not just six, but uh, each of the six uh, quarks comes in three colors, and similarly for the anti quark. Okay. Now this, uh, so all the individual quarks have fractional uh, electrical charges, but we don't see in nature any particles with fractional charges, and therefore it was considered that they always uh, they are always seen in nature as com composite particles in the form of hadrons, which should have net integer charge. And this assignment of two thirds minus one third charge, which was given to the uh, quarks, nicely explained the integral charges of all the elementary particles. So this is uh, this picture shows uh, the discovery of omega meson. So omega, if you remember, is the last particle in this decuplet, 
at the bottom which was the three strange quarks and at the time the quark model was uh, made this particle was not seen so this was a prediction of the uh, quark model and it was when it was seen experimentally this was considered considered to be a, a confirmation of quark model however in physics uh, you can make a number of beautiful theories but you need to have their experimental validation so even though quark model was explaining everything the question that where are the quarks was, was still there so to save uh, the quark model the proposal was made that they are always confined within the baryons and mesons they cannot be separated because the force between them is has this property that if you increase the distance between the particles the force increases and if you try to so quarks can only be found in the bound states and what keeps them together it is uh, the gluons so there are particles uh, gluons called gluons which are being exchanged in the three quarks inside the proton are interacting with each other and this gluon keeps them together so why don't we see them again the hypothesis of quark confinement which says that if i try to break a uh, quark by trying to separate the uh, uh, I, if i try to break up uh, uh, composite particle like c c bar bound state here if i try to separate these two i have to pump in energy and as i uh, keep on pumping energy and try uh, trying to separate them then interaction between them keeps on increasing okay and at some point the interaction energy becomes so much that the particle um, breaks up and out of vacuum a lot of new quark and anti quark pair gets created and then these original quark and anti quark they form bound state with these pairs which are called virtual pairs which are being created and instead of seeing uh, the c and c bar in your detectors you see the bound states of c and c bar these are called the particles d and uh, d, uh, d plus and d minus so quarks can never be seen uh, however you still needed experiments to confirm your theory so what kind of experiments as we have seen uh, discussed the experiments are accelerator experiment and this was uh, the evidence for uh, for for quarks came in this experiment Called the deep elastic scattering experiment. These were done at uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in 1970s, early 1970s uh, and late 60s. And in these experiments, the electron and electron beam uh, scattered from a proton target, and one looked at the scatter uh, spectrum of the scattered electron beam. The proton breaks up, you get lot of hadrons, but you don't bother about this part. You just look at the spectrum of this electron. just like in the rutherford scattering experiment by looking at the uh, spectrum of the scattered particles you could figure out that there, there is some something at the center in this experiments also the uh, scattering cross section that you uh, uh, found showed that the charge of the, all the charge of the proton is concentrated in three points and three lumps and which were called uh, which which could be then on a detailed analysis could be identified with the u u and d quarks so then the question was so this stuff these experiments in 1970 early 1970 established the quark model and therefore uh, from the hundreds of particles between 1932 to 1970 in 1970 we had a smaller list of elementary particles that were the three quarks and their anti quarks and the leptons but the question was are there only three of them or are, uh, can there be more now in uh, uh, while all this was happening a uh, uh, quark model was being made and the particles are being detected Theoreticians were also coming up with the theories, the theories to explain the behavior of the particles, and the theory uh, uh, required that there should be a fourth quark. So these people, uh, Glashow, Eliopoulos, and Mainani, they said they uh, observed that uh, there are certain decays which should take place in the three quark model, but which are not uh, taking place. And again, therefore, there that indicated that there is something more. So what they proposed was that if there is a fourth quark, then this uh, suppression of these decays can be explained. And this was indeed found in 1974 simultaneously in two places. This is called November Re Revolution. Uh, the two papers, one uh, from the East Coast, Bukowski National Park is in New York, uh, lab is in New York, and uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator Center is uh, in California. And um, both the labs detected this. resonance which was called j psi resonance because one group uh, the the two papers came one at, at a difference of two days one day actually and one of them called it j particle the other called psi particle it is still called j psi particle and it was uh, obviously this resonance could not be explained in terms of anything um, that was known in terms of the three quark model 
and it was necessary to assume uh, to uh, um, that, uh, that uh, to assume that there is a fourth quark is which was given the charm quark so uh, from the three quark picture we had uh, four uh, quark picture with the j psi particle and uh, this part this uh, quark could be put into two generations so u and d in the theory u and d uh, couple and c and s couple c is the charm s is strange, strange. and uh, these were called the first generation and second generation so the first four quarks were grouped in pairs and things were very uh, good at that point however uh, in 1977 another new what resonance was detected so resonances appear like this okay? so looking at the energy you can find the uh, at which the resonance takes place you can find the mass of the particle which has been created and this uh, experiment uh, found that this new resonance must be bounced out of a new quark which was called the bottom quark okay, so it was a bound state of bb bar and b and b bar just like uh, the psi was bound state of c and c bar and uh, that again uh, disturbed the uh, balance uh, uh, that uh, quarks always come into pairs so the, so, uh, the question was are, is there another sixth quark is there a third generation of quarks also now we have been talking about quarks so far but uh, at the same time the leptons were also showing this kind of behavior of being in uh, pairs so each of the electron has a neutrino with it so electron and electron neutrino mu one and mu one neutrino so uh, there were already two generations uh, of leptons which we have already talked about mu one neutrino was also found in 1962 experimentally verified but then around uh, the middle uh, mid 70s people saw some experiments and uh, involving leptons only which could not be explained by uh, in terms of electrons and muons and it became necessary to uh, propose that there is a third lepton existing which is which is called the tau lepton and uh, like all the other, other two leptons muon and electron it also comes to this known neutrino which was finally detected in 2000 uh, year 2000 so uh, by the time b quark was uh, seen in the lab uh, the idea of three generations was already there and theory also demanded that the number of quarks should be the same as the number of leptons so therefore uh, people believe that there is a sixth quark existing and the search for the partner of bottom quark started it took about 20 years and then in the year 1995 uh, in fermi lab in pp bar collision this particle was found which was called the top quark this is the event uh, so you have a proton this is u u d anti proton uh, which is u bar d bar d bar Uh, u bar u bar d bar they collide they create a gluon and then that decays into a top anti uh, top uh, so uh, and then this because top has a very short uh, lifetime it decays further into a bottom quark and uh, a w plus this d bar also decays into a d bar and a w minus w plus decays further into muon and neutrino so uh, electron and neutrino and the bottom and anti bottom they give you jets of particles jets of hadrons So you can see that it's a very complicated uh, process, and it it requires a lot of effort by the experimentalists to uh, rule out this event from everything else that is ha happening here, because this proton-antiproton collision can create a lot of other things also. So you have to uh, find a signal which can be discriminated from all the other events that are taking place. However, so uh, with the discovery of this top quark, the picture was completed that there are uh, three generations of matter particles. uh first generation has u and d quark electron and neutrino and you see that everything electron neutron proton and uh, us are all the atoms and uh, molecules are made up of the first generation second generation has charm quark strange quark and muon and its neutrino and the third generation has top and bottom quarks tau lepton and its uh, neutrino uh these are all the matter particles uh, however uh, uh the theory also Wants to know how these particles interact with one another, and the theory that was being made uh, uh, required that the force between these matter particles should be mediated by what are called intermediate vector bosons of the force particles. We have already seen that photon is the mediator of electromagnetic force, and uh, and uh, similarly, one uh, uh, one needed to uh, confirm the hypothesis that weak interactions are mediated by. W and Z and the strong interactions are mediated by gluons. So where are uh, how do you see them in the lab? So this discovery of gluon came in 1979. It 
in what are called the three jet events uh, uh, this this was done in germany basically and uh, this uh, three jets is you you combine two particles of equal and opposite charge there will be two uh, uh, quark and antiquark coming in opposite directions which will uh, be seen in the detectors as jets of hadrons so if there if there are uh, if the if only q q bar is being produced in your collision of electron and positron for example then you should see two jets in opposite directions these three jet events showed three jets okay and th this meant that there is a third particle also coming out which is giving rise to a jet and this third particle must be neutral because otherwise you don't have the charge conservation and this was identified with the gluon so this uh, experiment was the confirmation of gluons uh, similarly w and z bosons uh, they were needed by the uh, theory of electromagnetic interactions uh, which was constructed in uh, 1969 or so and this required uh, w and z bosons to be massive particles and these particles were seen in 1983 uh, by carlo rubia and his team at cern and these are the uh, um, ex these are the processes which are taking place uh, through which they were detected these are the pictures of the actual events which uh, took place when w and z were detected so now my picture my uh, picture of elementary particles has the matter particles their anti particles the vector bosons okay and uh, these mat uh, matter field interact with the interaction of force to the exchange of force particles but then there is also the higgs boson so why was there was why there was so much uh, noise about higgs boson why we will people were uh, looking for uh, higgs boson if you know uh, all the particles that make up the matter and all the particles which are responsible for the interaction uh this has to do with the uh, actual theory the standard model is not just uh, you know collection of particles and, and beautiful pictures it has a mathematical framework based on a certain theory which is called a gauge theory and this gauge theory requires that these intermediate particles should be always massless however we know that w and z are not massless so one of the problem with the standard model was that it does not explain the masses of the particles and for that reason mr higgs supposed to propose this idea of higgs field uh, and that this is the field which is responsible for giving the masses to the particles so the higgs field he higgs mechanism is, uh, says that there is a higgs field which is spread all over the space and the particles intermediate bosons or the particles are uh, massless to begin with but when they through pass through this higgs field they acquire masses it is very much like uh, if you have a glass uh, if you have a uh, glass empty glass and a spoon and you stir the spoon you can easily uh, uh, move the spoon but if the glass is filled with uh, honey then it is more difficult to move the spoon and it looks like the spoon is has acquired some mass so this is a famous picture uh, there was a contest uh, uh, in in uk um, so the uk science minister said that uh, any scientist who will explain to me in with one or two uh, a4 size papers that uh, what is a higgs particle uh, i will give her a bottle of champagne or something like that some stupid uh, bet and uh, uh, this uh, scientist came up with this picture where he shows that there is a room full of people there is enough space between people so they can move freely around but then uh, the then a vip enters this is margaret thatcher she enters and all the people throng around us and she find it difficult to move through this room it it is as if she has acquired some mass so this is a very simple simplistic picture of uh, higgs mechanism but basically the idea is that the higgs particle gives rise to the masses give the masses to other particles and therefore it is absolutely necessary for the theory to be valid and that is why uh, and then since just like electromagnetic field has a quantum associated with which uh, with it which is called the photon higgs field also has a quantum associated with it and that is called the higgs boson so uh, therefore people believe that in order for the consistency of the standard model the the higgs boson must exist and this was uh, proposed in uh, late 60s and the search for it went on the large hadron collider was made with the aim of detecting this particle and finally in 2012 when this particle was detected uh, was found in a uh, large hadron collider in cern uh, it was firmly uh, established that standard model is the correct uh, description of the particle physics quantum 
these are the events uh, which were detected in 2012. Uh, so uh, just like the top one, each boson is not directly seen in the detector, it decays. And then you look at the decay product and you reconstruct the uh, process and you try to find out uh, if, if, this could have been, if, if these signals are coming from the Higgs or something else. All these experiments require a lot of uh, big computers and uh, data analysis and so on. Hundreds of uh, countries, thousands of uh, scientists, many, many computers, uh, grid computing, everything is involved in the analysis of these experiments. So with the discovery of Higgs boson, the standard model, as we know, as the established theory of particle physics was established, we have the matter particles, uh, the quarks, the leptons, you have the force particles, W, Z, W minus, photon, and the gluons, and you have the Higgs boson. This is a very simple uh, picture of the standard model, but believe me, there's a lot of um, mathematics to be learned and done to even understand it. And uh, to work in this field, you have to be really theoretical field, you have to be uh, really very patient with the mathematics. So this is uh, an additional uh, picture that I like to show. Uh, because of my bias to th towards theory, which shows the different time difference between the uh, pr uh, prediction of a, a particle and the discovery. And you will see that in most of the cases, the red, the red bars are the discovery date and the blue bar are the th uh, 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 dates on which the particles were uh, theorized or proposed. And you can see that in most cases, red is much ahead of uh, much be, much later than the uh, blue ones. Uh, Dr. Kolvankar, how much time I have? Uh, madam, you can uh, speak for uh, 10 minutes more because uh, uh, we did not start exactly at 4 o'clock. At least, yeah. I'll, I'll speak for 5 uh, minutes more and then I'll take yeah, yeah, Sure. So uh, you can see in this graph, for example, uh, this is, uh, uh, um, let me look at something. Uh, electron neutrino, for example, 1932, it was hypothesized and it was seen in 1956. Similarly for the neutrino, muon neutrino. Higgs boson in uh, 1964, it was uh, proposed and it was seen in 2012. So uh, in many cases, theory has been much, much ahead of the experiment. In some cases, there have been uh, hints from the experiment also. And uh, for example, here, in case of uh, uh, muon, it is almost simultaneous. In case of bottom also, in, in case of tau lepton also, it is almost simultaneous. So, uh, so it is very important uh, to uh, understand that even though uh, physics is an experimental subject, theory has pay, played a major role, a very important role in the development of the subject. And uh, some of you may find it interesting to work in uh, theoretical uh, areas. So now I come to the end of the talk, is that the end of the journey. We have uh, started from electron and uh, come up to the Higgs boson. And we, I said that it gives a complete picture. Is it really complete? So there are certain things which are not explained by the uh, standard model. For example, it does not uh, tell us what should be the mass, uh, what should be the Higgs mass. And that is why it took so such long uh, such a long time to uh, find the uh, Higgs mass. If you know exactly where to look for it, then you can look for it there. But there was no prediction about the Higgs mass by the standard model. But one thing that it said was that if if the standard model is the complete theory, then the mass should have been between 180 GeV and 200 GeV. But the mass that was found was 125 GeV, and this itself is an indication that there is something more than the standard model. And therefore, people, uh, the next thing that uh, the particle physicists uh, have to do is to look for physics beyond the standard model and try to explain why this mass is what it is. Another uh, motivation for going beyond the standard model is the ultimate dream of, part, uh, of physics is to have unification. For example, electricity and mag magnetism, they were supposed to be totally different uh, 100 years back. But then Max, uh, more than 100 years back, actually, uh, then Maxwell uh, came up with this theory and we combine electricity and magnetism. So, uh, and they, this was called the electromagnetic force. Similarly, the theory of weak interactions, Glashow and Salam model, combined electromagnetic 
force and weak uh, force into a single pole, which is called the electro weak force. So the uh, hope is that one will one will be able to unify all the three forces into a single force if one goes to sufficiently high energies. What do I mean that? Uh, by by that what I mean is that the coupling constants of the three uh, theories. Although we call them constants, are actually not constants. They are functions of the energy scale or the length scale. So as you vary energy, uh, or as you change the distance, the value of the coupling constant changes. And one hopes that at certain certain uh, high energies, all the three coupling constants will, will become a single force, and uh, at that uh, there will be a single coupling of this unified theory. Now, if I look at the standard model, so in the standard model, there is a way to calculate this, what is called running of the coupling constant and how it changes with the energy. And if one works out, does this calculation, one finds that the three couplings do not cut, do not meet at a point. However, there are theories beyond the standard model, for example, supersymmetric models, which in which this can happen. And therefore, people started looking for theories which can explain uh, such things. and. Uh, the experiments have been looking for signatures of uh, new particles or new signatures uh, coming from these beyond standard model theories. So far, nothing has been seen. Another reason to go beyond standard model is that in standard models, the neutrinos are supposed to be uh, masters. However, there have been certain experiments which have at the beginning of the century which have shown that neutrinos actually are not masters. They have consequence, they can also convert from one to another. So this, uh, to explain this fact, we need to have some uh, theory beyond this. There are many other uh, questions which are still not answered by standard model. For example, what is the dark matter made up of? Why we have um, matter in the universe? Where is the antimatter? If they were created uh, an equal amount at the beginning of the universe, where did the antimatter go? Why there are only three generations? All these questions uh, need answer. And therefore, there is still uh, more to do for the experimentalists. There is much more to do for the uh, theoreticians, uh, experimentalists, and uh, th therefore, uh, there is uh, the journey has not come to an end. It need to go on. So, to summarize uh, what I have uh, tried to convey: the journey of elementary particle physics has been a beautiful with the discovery of Higgs boson, all the pieces of a standard model have been found. The road ahead is to look for physics beyond the standard model. These are very challenging times ahead for both experimentalists and theoreticians. The journey must continue. This is the search for truth. And I hope that some of you will be will join this journey and will be able to see. Light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. This is the LHC tunnel, which I talked about, underground tunnel, in which the particle beams are accelerated. So, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I can